Hey everybody, welcome back. We're going to talk more about confidence intervals today. Um, I misspoke a little bit in terms of saying that we're going to get to actually the, a lot of the math behind it. We're going to again explore some things and then we'll get to the math behind it actually in the next video. But anyway, we're going to talk about what does this mean to be 95% confident. This is one of those topics that tends to get really misinterpreted um, when people talk about statistics and so we really want to kind of drive home today using a demonstration um, that I think is going to hopefully make an impact on you guys. Um, so in this activity, there's a URL up here. I'll link to it down below along with the notes. Um, while you're down there, hit like and subscribe if you want. Um, so we're going to use this applet to learn what we what it means to say when we're saying 95% confidence um, is our that our confidence interval captures the true proportion of what's going on. So anyway, um, we go to this applet. We're going to set the population. Let me switch over. We're going to set the um, true proportion to 0.5. We're going to set it also to 95, a confidence level to 95 and a sample size to 75. So we're going to take a sample. And if you look at that, this is our confidence interval right here. Now, the only thing is, if you check it out, you'll see that it doesn't necessarily, it might actually, if you look really closely, I'm not sure about yours, but mine doesn't really even hit. Actually, it says down here, it doesn't hit um, the true proportion. And so going to go through and hit another nine of these. So we have a total of 10. And so now you'll notice here that I got eight hits out of 10. OK, so coming back here to our notes, it says, did the first in the confidence interval capture the true proportion? Mine was no. Yours might be yes. Um, and then repeat this 10 times, sketch to the right, and how many intervals actually captures it. So I ended up with 8 out of 10. And so when you do this, and I would encourage you to do this on your own, I'm going to go through and I'm going to go and match each of these. So like my first one was here. Actually, you know what? Well, I'll speed this up for production. How about that? All right. So if you look at this, like here, this one right here captures my p-value of 0 0.50. This one here doesn't capture it. And that's the thing about your samples. I mean, we've done that before. We also know, like, for example, there's a whole bunch of things that can um, work on your mean and your standard deviation. That's what we're going to start leading into. So anything that covers this line of 0.5 captures it, and the ones that miss it don't. Um, also notice all of these are the same size, because I mean, if you think about it, they, sh they should go ahead and be the same size confidence interval, because you're doing the same thing, just starting with a different um, approximation point. So then we're going to go ahead and hit reset, and we're going to do this a total of 100 times. So let me come back here, reset it. 25, 50, 75, 100. So now my percentage hit that I did, I got 80% when I did 10. Now I'm doing 95% of my confidence intervals hit what's going on. So again, it's going to be one of those things. So like here, why would, why would it make sense that I got more of them to hit what I've got? Well, it's closer to our enemy. Closer. And why does that make sense? More samples. The more samples you take, we know that we get closer and closer and closer to the mean, right? Same thing goes here. If I take more and more samples, I'm going to get closer to whatever the true proportion is going to be, right? So, and again, just as you go through this, your answers are going to be different for all of these. Now, from this point on, we're going to kind of start seeing some fun stuff here. Here, hit the wrong button before, so sorry I had to reset this. Um, but this looks different. We're going to take these. So here are all my 95% confidence levels. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise this to 99. What happens to your confidence intervals when we increase the confidence level from 95 to 99? They get wider. Why would they have to get wider? Well, if you want to be more confident, you need to cast a bigger net. You need to have a bigger area in which to, say, 
the numbers falling in here. And in fact, in mine, if you look down here, my hit percent, I'm actually going from 95 to 99. All right. So if I come back here, the intervals get wider and capture more of the true population's per, um, per, uh, proportion um, being 0.5. And again, the wider the interval, you capture more. So because of that, that allows us to say the confidence goes up. Okay, so we are going to now reset and we're going to hit 80% confident. You're going to do 100 of those. Oops. Hello, stop. Okay, so I did 100 of those and I got 81%, which is actually better than the one I got before, before I screwed everything up. Stuff you take out in editing, right? So I got 81%, so that was actually better than the 72 that I had before. Okay, so what percent captures the true proportion? 81% of these capture the true proportion. Now, in terms of the interpretation, most of the time when I do this, students get something along the sand, these lines. 80% of the intervals capture the true proportion. Actually, let's even say of P equals 0 0.5. Now, the way that we're going to say this when we report this out, and the way that we're going to do this for proportions, and the way that we're going to do it with means when we hit part two is the following. If we take many, many samples and calculate the confidence level for each, we're going to expect about 80% of them to capture the true population proportion. All right? So you're not, when you say 80% confident, you're saying if we did this over and over, the true proportion is going to be within 80% of those intervals. Okay, it's not an 80% probability that it ca captures it. It's not saying that um, you know 80% of the true values of p fall within here. It's saying if I did this process over and over and over again, 80% of them would actually capture it. And this is kind of where, if I if I read those articles right, kind of where the um, pollsters in 2016 ended up making the mistake versus what they were doing in 2020. Um, you know, if you keep on running things tighter and tighter, you need to run lots and lots and lots of modeling for it and make sure you've got the right setups for that to make sure that you can make projections on elections and things like that. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to see how sample size affects things, okay? And so we have to go ahead and reset this. I'm going to set the sample size for 20. And if we're going to take one sample, notice what's going on here. We have a confidence interval. And so we've got our point estimate, and now we've got plus or minus 14%. So that's a fairly wide net. You've got a range here of 28%. Now, if I change this up to 250 and I take a single sample, notice now my margin of error is only 4%. It's gotten much narrower. Now, as you think about what we've done so far this year, what else gets affected and is made smaller when the sample size goes up? Yeah, you're right, the standard deviation, right? So that means that our margin of error is going to have to somehow probably be linked to that. Um, and so we're going to talk more about that. But this the margin of error does measure the, uh, the variability. So coming back to our notes here, which I've had a hard time bouncing back and forth before for some things, so I'm sorry about that. So the, um, what happens? The interval is much smaller, smaller narrower, can't read. Um, as the sample size goes up, the variability in the sampling goes down. All right, so a couple of things here. Um, so as our confidence interval, or excuse me, confidence level, As my confidence level goes up, that means my margin of error is going to go up as well. All right. Now, the other thing to remember down here, though, is that as my sample size goes up, my margin of error is going to go down. And so that is one way that you can, we're going to start talking about how you can, if you want to be more confident, one of the best ways you can do to control that increasing your margin of error is also going to be increasing your sample size. All right. So I hope that made an impact on you. Play around with the app a little, a little bit more if you need to have it kind of ingrained in you a little bit more. Um, I'm going to end this here. We're going to do part two where we're going to write down all the important bits and go through an example um, here in a second. So we'll talk to you soon.